Being an actor in Hollywood is one of the most desired, yet one of the most difficult professions when coming to Los Angeles. In this episode of Cinema Confidential, we're going to introduce you to a few people and their struggles to get to the top. Thank you. The nominees for Best Performance by an Actress are Anne Bancroft in The Miracle Worker, Betty Davis in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, Catherine Hepburn, Long Day's Journey in Tonight, Geraldine Page for Sweet Bird of Youth, and Leah Remick for Days of Vine and Roses. And the winner is... Anne Bancroft. It is my great pleasure that on today's episode of Cinema Confidential, we have actor Philip Boyd with us, who is going to tell us all about his amazing career. I'm no. sure you have plenty of stories. I've been around for <laughs> 25 years doing it, so I hope that I have a few stories. Yeah. Oh, great. So well, let's start from the beginning. Okay. Why acting? Well, it's funny. Um, I had an older brother growing up. Uh, he was a year older than I was, and he got involved in the theater program in our school uh, back in a place called Conyers, Georgia. Yeah, I was always um, consumed by like art growing up. I wanted to like I wanted to play piano. I wanted to play guitar. I uh, wanted to draw. Uh, unfortunately, the town that I grew up in it was very much a sports related type environment so my father encouraged me to do sports rather than be in the arts yeah. and so when I just when I went through being sports and realizing that I wasn't going to make it in a professional sport you know I just felt something bigger calling me and so as soon as that you know that that part of my life ended I wanted to have my own voice and so I moved to California when I was 19. That's bald. <laughs> yeah, because I knew this. If it wasn't going to be sports, it was going to be something in the entertainment business. Yeah. And then in the first two months, I booked a job acting. Hey. <laughs> and it was called Raising Canes with an S. There's a movie called Raising Cain. And it was about another family growing up in a small town and that type of thing. And I played an older boyfriend or, or a love interest of a, of a woman named Michelle Williams. Michelle Williams had a yeah. fantastic career, but I got to play her love interest in the in the series for six episodes, but we never aired. Oh no! I know. <laughs> so, what was the the first project that you actually felt was big and meaningful and aired? Uh, so there's been a couple. Um, one was a show called ER. Yeah. Uh, I got to be, uh, I got to do a guest star on that spot. The on whole that show. world hit yeah. in ER. <laughs> yes, I, and I figured. Um, and I got flown to Chicago to film the scene. And I, I wasn't in it that much, but I got to get the first class airfare to Chicago. You know, I felt like I had made it. Uh, went to Chicago and got put up in a hotel and got to hang out with the cast and everything and and anthony edwards directed the episode who oh, played nice. goose and yeah. top gun which is yeah. one of my favorite movies of all time and to get to be directed by him was something i was like wow this is really neat <laughs> you know brian neil if it does turn out you'll go down in history what kind of thoughts do you have about that when the thought hits you uh gosh suppose that flight successful we're planning on that flight being successful uh, I, I just meant how you feel about being a part of history. I think I can shed some light here. What is, according to you, the quality of a good director? You obviously worked with him. You worked with Forrest Whitaker as a director. Yeah. You've worked with Damien Chazelle as a director. The difference between like a good director and a director that is like a power trip. Like Damien Chazelle is somebody that knows what he wants. He sent us, every actor on the, on the film, he sent us a 300-page picture book with everything detailed in it, exactly what he was going to shoot. He wanted to make Ryan Gosling's character, Neil Armstrong, be very serious, very, you know, and then very serious so much to the point that it made the reporter a little bit nervous. Mm -hmm. And so we did it a couple of times and then I saw Damien talk to Ryan up on the, up on the platform and I 
and I asked him a question and Ryan did something where he like, he goes, I know what you said to me, he, like out of the blue, like started changing the dialogue. And I'm like, uh, uh, oh, God. no, I, I said, you know, <laughs> whatever. And then, so, so that's what he wanted. He wanted to throw you he off. He wanted to throw me off. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, so he comes back around and, and Damien says, sorry, man, we changed the dialogue. I said, well, I mean, Ryan, he's just so damn handsome. I just, <laughs> you know, got a little thrown off there. <laughs> and everybody laughed. And it was of fun. course. Yeah. What does your tattoo mean? The five? Mm -hmm. Now this, okay, this is a story that not a lot of people know. This will be the first time that I'm ever telling it on camera. So oh, wow. you get this story. <laughs> so I told you about my brother who passed away uh, okay. seven years ago of cancer. Uh, we were a year apart. We grew up playing sports together. Uh, my number was always number five. When my brother was diagnosed with cancer, uh, he went through some treatments and then it got bad. And so I, I left California and I went back to Georgia to be with him, to be by his side and to make sure that he was gonna get through this cancer treatment. So I show up and his, his uh, counts is, if, were really high and, and through the process of me being there, his counts went back down to normal. Wow. And we thought he was gonna pull out of it like a mir miracle, you know? So when his counts got to a certain number, I decided to go back to California and let him finish his treatments and be okay. Well, I went back to California and about two weeks after I went back to California, he spiked the other direction and he went into hospice care. And I used to draw the number five on my hand all the time because I always wanted a tattoo of it, but I just never got a tattoo of it. And one night, I went to, I went to sleep and I, I couldn't sleep. Something was, something was wrong. I, I didn't know what it was, but I had fallen asleep for about an hour. And during the time I was asleep, I had a dream where he was in the dream with me and we were sitting across each other on the counter talking about life and talking about his kids and talking about, you know, just the future type thing. And so I woke up and my mom was calling me from Georgia and I said, I answered the phone, I said, what is it? She goes, well, your brother's about to pass away. Um, the hospice nurse says he's only got a couple of hours left. I'm gonna hand the phone to him so you can say whatever you wanna say to him and uh, that'll be your last words, you know? Um, so she hands me the phone to him and I said, hey David, I'm gonna see you as soon as I can. I'm gonna get on the first plane I can to come see you. And he said, what are you talking about? I just saw you. And I said, okay. Yeah. I said, but I'm gonna get on the plane as soon as I can to come see you. So. I tried to call the air. I called the airline that right after that phone call. Said I need a flight out. You know, no flights that day. Out of all the airlines, there were all the flights were booked to Georgia. So I got on a flight the next day, and he's still alive. I fly in the next day. I think it was a Tuesday. I fly in. As soon as I get off the plane, I call, make sure he's still alive. And uh, sorry. Um, so they said he was, and um, so I, I, get in, I get in the car, the rental car, and I drive to the house where he was in hospice care. And I show up to the house and the whole family's there. And they're all in the, in the living room. And I open, they open the door and they say, hey, listen, just to let you know, he's in the back room and he's in a coma. He hasn't been able to speak or he hasn't woken up all day. You know, but you can go sit with him if you want to. So I go back to the bedroom, I open the door, and uh, as soon as I open the door, he looks up. And I walk over to him and, and he goes, I'm at the end of my road. I said, I know that, I know, I'm here. So I sat there with him, me and his wife, and his daughter came in and, and we sat there for a while and we talked about everything and then played some of his favorite music. Uh, like Pearl Jam was one of his favorite bands. And 
And so we played all the Pearl Jam songs and we talked to them, you know, for a long time and, and, and laid there with them. And then he passed away. And the hospice nurse said, I'm calling it at 555. And I was like, you sure? It's not 554, 556, like it's 555. And so uh, it's crazy, but he died with a smile on his face. And he was cremated. So the following year, I had some of his ashes and I was back in California and I decided that I was gonna go spread some of his ashes up PCH down by the water. Yeah. So I get in my car at five o'clock in the morning pitch black outside. I it started driving. Five o'clock for a reason. Yeah, well, I, I drew, I, I, I planned on getting up at five o'clock yeah. and driving out and I was gonna spread his ashes at 5.55. And so I'm driving up and it's like 5.48 and, I'm, and I can't find a street to turn off on. So I said, okay, the next street I find, I'm just gonna turn off this street and go park down by the water and just get there as soon as I can. I drive down, the street takes me right down by the beach I had a backpack with a camera, a bottle of water, and some of his ashes in it. I run down to the beach, and I'm looking at my phone to see what time it was, and it's like 5.53, and I'm like, okay, all right, I have some time to say some things. And so I, I said at 5.55, I said, you know, show me you're still in my life, and you know, that you'll be a part of me for the rest of my life, and sort of thing. So 5.55 hit, and I spread his ashes, and I sit there for a minute, just, you know, enjoying the moment. And so I turn around and go back to my car and right behind me, which I missed because it was pitch black, right behind me the whole time I'm there is a lifeguard stand with a big number five on it. <laughs> and so I just start laughing, like just like looking up going, okay, all right, I get you. you always be my life. Right. And so I get back in my car and I'm driving back down PCH. It gets better. Um, I'm driving back down PCH, my, I'm on the phone with my mother telling her what just happened, and uh, my gas light comes on, and I still had a ways to go, so I pull into a gas station, and I get out of the car, I start pumping my gas. I'm at gas pump number five. I'm like, this is crazy. It's crazy. So then I'm going to meet some friends of mine at a restaurant called Lucy's El Adobe on Melrose, and we had known the owner uh, there, and some friends were meeting me there, and. We show up and we always sit in the back patio area. And the owner says, are you here to meet, you know, Neil and Ruve? And I said, yeah. She goes, I know you guys want to sit in the back patio today, but it's closed off for a private party for KTLA Channel 5. She goes, but you guys can still <laughs> sit back there. <laughs> and I had drawn the number five on my hand that morning. So right after that lunch, yeah. I went and got it tattooed on my hand. And it just things like that happen a lot, like just, where I'm at in my life, some fives always tend to pop up. Yeah, it started raining, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but my God, thank you for that story. Yeah, Have of course. Have you considered writing that into a feature film? Not yet, but uh, it'll be in my book it, when I write my book, you know. You should. Now everybody knows it, but. <laughs> See what? Oh, please, no more. Yes, you can. Block out the pain. That's enough. This is torture. Kim, stop. He needs to finish. Not today, he doesn't. Haley's right. The bond isn't broken until he doesn't feel the pain of transformation anymore. If we want to get back at Klaus for everything he's done to us, Adrian has to keep turning. He doesn't have to do anything. Well, I'm very happy that today on Cinema Confidential, we have Micah Parker as our guest. Why are you an actor, Micah? Hmm. Well, I guess, uh, you know, I could take it all the way back to when I was a kid. Um, my father put me in, in, in little plays and stuff when I was really young, like five, six years old. I was doing stuff at uh, like church plays. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think I ever, it was just a very natural thing. And I don't think I ever really realized exactly why I was drawn to it until really recently. and. Um, it was because one of my idols kind of put it into words for me, which is Jim Carrey. And he said, you know, I always just felt like I had this gift for making people feel better, you know? And I, so I think about when I was a kid, I would always put on little plays and little shows at my house for whether it was my parents or family gatherings and stuff, just to, 
entertain make people, just to make better. people laugh and feel better. I did sports and all this stuff, and then I, uh, my senior year of high school, I did uh, Hello Dolly in school, so musical theater. I sang, and, and uh, it kind of brought it all back to me, all these feelings as a kid when I would perform for my parents. This is what I meant to do. I just knew it, you know, it's like. Yeah. Can we say that the first, I guess, bigger project that you were part of mm -hmm. is Vampire Diaries? Yes. Tell me That's... more about that experience. Um, well, so I, that, I booked Vampire Diaries three week, weeks after I moved to LA. So I guess I cool. could take that back to, it all started when I was living in New York. I was living in New York, um, you know, right before I moved out here. And I just remember being on my fire escape after I'd made the decision to move. I remember sitting out there and just energetically, this may sound weird, but just kind of like sending this wave of energy out to LA and I just made up my mind. I was like, I'm gonna get there and I'll be a working actor when I arrive. That's all I'm going for. And I went there and it didn't happen the day of. I mean, it was tough, uh, but it happened quick. And I got the audition, sent in a audition tape. And the next day I found out that they were gonna be flying me to Atlanta to shoot. And it was just, it was bizarre. Uh, and so I remember the first day just being on set with guys and gals and who I had seen on TV for the past few years. And it was just, it was really surreal, you yeah. know? You had this huge camera in your face, something you've always dreamed of doing, and then there it is, it's happening. And it, it's so, it was so hard to take it all in, but I just tried, you know, just to be present. And, and as probably any actor will tell you, it's, you go up and you go down. You go up and you go down, and that's exactly what I've experienced. So after Vampire Diaries, it's a wave of auditions, big opportunities, and then nothing happened for almost a year until I did Mob City, which was huge for me. You know, working with uh, Frank Darabont, who's a huge idol of mine, Ed Burns, Robert yeah. Nepp, all these amazing actors. John Bernthal, who's blown up, had this scene where Ed Burns uh, is playing my superior. I play like this little, you know, mobster kid. Uh, I was trying to earn his stripes with the big boss. And we were sent to go and assassinate this guy. And we're basically just wimping out, me and my partner. And uh, so I'm proposing this new idea and Ed Burns turns around and he goes, well, here's my idea. And he punches me in the face, breaks my nose. That's the scene, right? Yes. <laughs> Not supposed to happen in real life. Yeah. Uh, so we're doing it a bunch of times, and then one time we changed the angle, and Ed oh, caught me, <laughs> caught me pretty good, uh, just right, right in the schnoz. Uh, it was not terrible, but he just—I just remember him feeling so bad. He was like, "I'll send you a bottle of bourbon and all this stuff." <laughs> and so every time I go watch that scene, I just remember that moment because me, a kid, like working with Ed Burns, I'm like, wow. And then he punches me in the face, just put us on the same level immediately, you know? Yeah, yeah because uh, you're human, both Yeah, of you. exactly, <laughs> totally human. I've um, seen on your Instagram page that you do work out a lot. So yes. you take care a lot of yourself mm -hmm. um, in terms of a healthy lifestyle. Is that very important for the career that you have chosen or that's just something that you yourself feel like doing? Well, I think overall it's, it's just important for me in my life, you know, outside of acting, just health and, um, you know, just com kind of committing to an active lifestyle of, you know, being able to use the time and, and the body that I have to do, you know, active things. Um, but being an actor, it kind of brought that forefront in my life. like. You know, because you, obviously you're on camera and you have to stay in shape. You have to look, you know, you have to look like the handsome guy, you know. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it was always there because of that. But then through acting, I, I auditioned for a, uh, a boxing movie like five, five, six years ago. And when I did audition for that, I had to send in a tape of me boxing. And I never boxed before at the time. Uh, I found out like that was a huge reason I didn't get the part. But uh, <laughs> they just said, you know, he's got to work on his boxing. And I took that, I was like, next time I get an opportunity, I'm gonna be ready for that. 
So I got obsessed with boxing now, and ever since, yeah, I'm hugely involved with a company called Rumble Boxing. I, I teach boxing classes as well. So it's become a huge part of my life and teaching this art to people and learning, being a constant student of, of pugilism, uh, fighting. And can you have like real relationships and friends in, in LA? Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I have a wonderful girlfriend as well. She's amazing. Is she an actress as well? Um, she's not. She's a dancer. Oh, no. Yeah. So it's entertainment, but different, you know. But she, she really gets it. I think it's, it's incredible about our relationship is that she allows me to be me and to go for my thing, and I do the same for her. Um, to you know, and we just try to support each other and, and help each other climb that, that ladder. You know. Thank you for that. That was a real positive yes. and I feel so energized now after talking nice. to you. Nice, amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's a pleasure.